We are um, in theater, the lively art. I am Professor Emily Seal, representing Motlow State Community College. Today we'll be covering chapters 9 and 10, which includes um, picking up with theater design, speaking about costuming, lighting, makeup, and sound, which is a lot of ground to cover. And um, just want to remind you that the nature of these theater appreciation courses is broad strokes. We're going to talk about in five minutes discussing a, a, an occupation that someone spends a lifetime perfecting. So please forgive the oversimplifications. Um, please forgive the uh, rude way that sometimes or crude way that I understand something that is deeply complex. So uh, please know this is just a drive-by version of what could be um, a more in-depth tour. So um, continuing to speak about technical theater. So costuming. I've already kind of told you costuming is one of my favorite elements of the theater and this is when I costumed the Wiz at Hattiesburg High. Those are the munchkins when Dorothy there in the blue dress arrives in munchkin land. Uh, she is Confronted by Glinda, which we talked about last time, Glinda was in that big blue bubble dress and it was pretty and she was floating in and speaking in a way that was indicative of her popularity. Uh, the Wiz is a different kind of story, which we talked about um, which we'll talk about more today. And uh, the student who I had playing Glinda was really funky and spunky and her personality and her uh, way of relating as an actor really came through and I wanted to create a costume for her that helped show her sense of style. Uh, and you know we call that typecasting, we didn't really talk about that when we talked about directing. Typecasting being um, that that sort of was her personality in real life and she just brought that to the stage. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if you look at people like Meg Ryan, um, even Tom Hanks, he's shown a certain amount of range but quite often he's just playing himself, who is likable. So um, you know when we come into a story, uh, colors indicate psychology, uh, but also what we wear makes us feel a certain way. Uh, I would challenge you to look into your wardrobe and say, um, okay, that certain pair of jeans makes me feel confident. Or maybe you buy something and on the rack you liked it, but once you get it on, uh, something about it just doesn't bring you to the right state of mind to go into your daily situation. So, um, of course, part of this is status, right? Uh, historically, People have invested tons of money, for example, a king in royal attire, wearing jewels on their head, fur on their back, um, primarily to say, I'm better than you, right? And uh, it's the same way today that a celebrity might wear uh, red-soled shoes, which indicate uh, that they are uh, blonics, you know, that they're expensive shoes that you couldn't possibly afford. And so there's always been a way of communicating through clothing and uh, we're no different today and it's definitely important on the stage to help tell those stories with costumes right that whole tribe of munchkins we know they're of the same world because they're all wearing the same thing right we also know they're one of many whereas Glinda is there to stand out with her bold costume <laughs> um, this is a picture of Wicked which I'm brought up last class is a precursor to the Wizard of Oz. It's a very famous musical um, uh, and uh, this is the original Broadway cast which is Adina Menzel there in the green and um, you know part of the secret of Wicked is that Universal Studios wanted to compete with Disney so they just poured tons of money into this production and the the designs are not to be believed. They are just out of this world. Beautiful. Um, and as I said, the um, status that's sort of, you, we see there that Glenda's got a crown and that she is, um, you know, the royal one in this situation. When she flies in, we see her importance. Um, and so costume 
can bring storytelling to life, especially in shows that rely heavily on subtext, such as Ibsen or Chekhov, where they're just having a rote conversation about the weather, but we're supposed to imply all this other stuff about them. Uh, it's really important in those situations for the, the designers to help tell the story. Um, you know, things that are caked in archaic language, really important to have the visual storytelling happening. <laughs> oh, bless it. This is a whole website if you want to be mean and waste an afternoon of low budget beasts. Um, obviously, these um, costume designers probably did the best with the amount of money that they had. And that's worth mentioning um, that it costs money to costume things. And so if you go to see a community theater production where even the actors don't have the money to put fancy costumes on stage, just know that you, you know, uh, they're doing the best that they can. We're going to give them the benefit of the doubt there that they're doing the best with what they can. And part of the responsibility of the costumer or any design really is to be reasonable with what they have. And, um, yeah, that's just pitiful. It's a really mean website, but very funny. So there I am again in the sewing shop. I already showed you that picture. Uh, so the l bottom of the totem pole when you walk into a costume shop was me sitting there stitching. Uh, the stitcher is just what it sounds like. They sew. The draper has a little more finesse when it comes to fitting a costume and patterning. So often in the theater we're doing couture work we're fitting or making a costume for a person to wear and we you know based on their bust size their chest uh, if they're a man uh, their their waist their hips we want to make sure that it fits like a glove and um, and if it doesn't fit well then it could be at risk of busting a seam it could be at risk of uh, looking bad on them which obviously if if they're playing a character that needs to look good <laughs> that matters so drapers are just professionals at knowing how certain fabrics fall uh, at patterning and um, at working with different kinds of fabrics so the head honcho if you're in a costume shop is a wardrobe supervisor they often um, you know keep reports uh, balance the budget uh, report to the producer directly uh, work with the designer to make sure that was this next one um, work with the designer to make sure that he or she uh, their vision is being you know um, correctly uh, there are other people's in costume shops uh, laundry people I have done that too <laughs> I've been at the bottom of the of the theater totem pole and uh, stayed up late doing the laundry for the, the for the next night uh, no shame in it uh, no shame in any kind of payment that you can get right um, uh, often during a show we'll have repairs and stitchers will come in to put uh, buttons back on costumes in the adrenaline in uh, costumes that see a lot of wear and tear in long runs of shows there's a lot of maintenance to be had and that's true of lights of sound you have to change the mics and the battery packs and the mics sometimes you have to change out cords that give out sometimes you have to change out light bulbs that burn um, you know shows take a certain amount of saying sustaining and uh, you know there's an old joke about a prop artist saying an actor's going to break that <laughs> and it's true we do so uh, maintaining things is sort of not the glamorous side he doesn't talk about it much in this book but it's definitely a large part of what we do in the theater especially when we're working on a budget is uh, maintaining the stuff we have so I've listed all these titles that uh, may go in the program, but really in small theater productions especially, this is Backstage Badger, he has a whole series of memes if you also have uh, time to troll the internet. Um, but, you know, I may have been the laundress and a stitcher, but if a prop needs painting and the prop artist is overwhelmed, I'm going to go over to the prop shop and paint a prop. Uh, you know. Every actor on the stage at Motlow has also served on a committee working backstage elements. Um, it takes a village when it comes to the theater. And, uh, you know, you may be an actor, but you may be helping another actor with a quick change. You may be an actor, but if you have experience with mics, then you're going to fix somebody's mic at intermission. Uh, it is any skill you have in theater uh, and you become part of that village, you you apply that skill uh, in in the moment especially because it is the lively art it's live things are happening that you can't control got to stay on top of it 
Ooh, this is one of my favorite places. I get excited just seeing the picture. This is uh, the old location of Performance Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, if you ever want to win at Halloween, I highly recommend you go visit Performance Studios. Um, they have a wonderful stock of costumes that you can rent, head-to-toe hats, um, wonderful robes. Uh, they have also have costumes available for purchase and I have been known to rent an entire show's costume. It's very cost-effective uh, to rent. Um, they do all the laundry, which once again, who needs laundry in their life, right? Uh, but acquiring costumes, you can go at it several ways. As my daddy would say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. You can pull which we have an inventory at Motlow. I didn't bother to take a picture of it. It's nothing flashy. It is a uh, two-story. I mean, it's it's big, uh, but um, it, it definitely sees a lot. You know, we've been doing theater at Motlow for 30-some-odd years now, so we've got a huge inventory to, uh, to work with, and um, it's a fun place to play. I love taking my students up there and letting them rummage around for what they can find uh, for the show that they have. And part of that inventory is us just being responsible with the money that we have as an institution. We don't have a huge budget. So we do the same plays every five years or so. We'll recycle a play we've already done and try to pull out some of those old costumes and save some money. Um, and so pulling inventory, uh, you know, one of the great things about staying in a job for a long time is I've come to know and love the inventory at the costume shop that I uh, work in uh, on the daily. And then, of course, I know the rental place. I kind of know what's available there, too. In the digital age, um, buying has become really fun, too. I can go and buy something from China and have it shipped in. That's uh really an exciting time to be a costumer because you have these resources, you have the ability to buy fabrics that you just, um, when I started in this industry 15 years ago, you just didn't have those sort of options, or, or at least they weren't available to me as a uh, as a lower player in, in the game. I'm sure, you know, Broadway, they've always been able to get China on the phone and send me some fabric. So the other option is to build, which honestly in this day and age is fun and rewarding and if I need something couture uh, if somebody's you know really tall uh, really small I, I may need to alter something um, but it's often not cost effective uh, it, there's this triangle we have in the theater and I wish I would have thought to put the image in but the question is time money quality I can give you two of the three it's gonna maybe cost you some time uh, but it's gonna come out with good quality work um, it may not cost you a lot of money, but it's going to cost you your time. So in the theater, money is, time is money. And so if I sit and belabor and hand sew that Dorothy costume like I did, uh, I may save money because the cost, the fabric wasn't that expensive, uh, but it's probably not going to save me my time, which I could be using on other elements of the show. And I'm a one-woman show as I record this. I'm the only theater professor at the Moore County campus who is uh, directing plays and costuming these plays. And so there's only so much of me to go around. And pulling is often what I choose or buying rather than building. Um, only in extreme cases do I build. And even then, half the time, I hire a stitcher. Uh, my sewing machine is more likely to be st sewing up pants that have ripped in between uh, shows rather than building something from scratch. But getting a, a costume that is handmade for you, oh, the magic. Oh, how they fit. I mean, buying something off the rack, it often, at least for me, doesn't fit right. You know, maybe it's too short or, uh, you know, this part's too baggy and the other part's too tight. Uh, having something couture, having something built just for you uh, feels so special. And uh, often the secret to looking nice in your clothes is that they fit well. So taking the time to measure people correctly, having the time to um, fit someone well is well worth it. So um, 
I've talked a little bit about my costume experience. Now I'm going to ask you to create a rendering, which we talked about last time, is a drawing, um, based on The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is a play that means a lot to Motlow. Um, we've done it over and over again in Debbie Zimmerman's many, many years with us. Every five years or so, she would do Wizard of Oz again. It's the great American fairy tale. And... Um, so here is one production that we did at Motlow, and I helped um, realize I wanted it to be purple and green, but you can say there it ended up um, blue and green. I worked with Debbie Zimmerman to help realize this uh, rendering, and then we handed that rendering off to the costume uh, stitcher for that show, and she made it a reality, and it was fabulous, if I do say so myself. So I'm asking you to pick a character from The Wizard of Oz and do a rendering. Notice how I've got little notes in the margin. Um, notice it's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's a tool with which to communicate. Um, you can see in the bottom right hand co corner I have the influence of a movie that I thought um, helped, you know, beyond The Wizard of Oz, helped sort of um, indicate or create the shapes and the lines for our munchkin. Um, she's actually the mayor's wife. And uh, so... So if you're going to do this assignment, you need to know a little bit more about the Wizard of Oz, and you can find out more about the assignment in your shell. Uh, there's more information there. It is in the way of grim. If you sit down and read the novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, it is dark, man. They show up uh, in China, and everybody's breakable. Um, those flying monkeys, whoo, terrifying. And the Brothers Grimm also told fairy tales that were meant to warn children. And, uh, you know, they often had gruesome endings and uh, horrible events, uh, but they were meant to scare children into behaving correctly. And uh, the American, great American fairy tale, The Wizard of Oz, definitely is gruesome and dark at times. There's a, a theory, which I can't really substantiate, that Frank Baum created this. He ran a general store, and he created this story in order to have a... Um, way to start talking about this political issue that was going on, which was the U.S. standard. And the U.S. standard uh, became a gold standard. Uh, he wanted it to be a silver standard. So there's a lot of coincidences if it's not, um, if it's, if it's not, wasn't used as a allegory, um, then there are a lot of coincidences. For example, Oz is the abbreviation for ounce. In the original novel, Dorothy's shoes were silver, which was a hint at that silver. Um, supposedly, the politicians were represented by the lion. You know, they have all of this voice, but they're cowering. The uh, farmers represented the scarecrows, and the industry, the, you know, industrial movement was in full swing. Those guys were the ten men. And they, of course, lacked heart in the running of their factories and such. And then Dorothy represented the All-American, you know, the um, our heroine from the middle. And even when we get into looking at uh, the Wicked Witch of the West, obviously the people who wanted the gold standard were the people out west who had all the gold. So... Um, it is a political issue I don't pretend to understand all of the nuances of, which is part of the reason, supposedly, that Frank Baum sat out to create this allegory. Uh, we talked in your textbook last time, we talked about what an allegory is. Um, C.S. Lewis famously wrote Chronicles of Narnia, which is also an allegory. Um, and allegory just means that each character represents a high-minded idea rather than just a simple story. It means more. And... Um, and I don't, you know, once again, I can't fully substantiate this theory of uh, the gold standard being what Frank Baum was exploring in The Wizard of Oz. But um, he also would just sit around in his country story store and tell stories to the children who came in. So he was able to get that feedback like an actor does, like a comedian does, feel out his audience, see what they gets a reaction, what doesn't get a reaction. And I do think that part of his success in creating this fantastic world was that he was able to test it on real people in real time. Um, so uh, there... <laughs> 
when we look at some of the costume choices from the Wizard of Oz film, uh, we can see that they did in fact reflect the age. The Wicked Witch of the West in the illustrations in the novel, uh, you can see that everyone is wearing those pointed hats, partially just because those pilgrim hats were popular. They were easier to make. Uh, the shape was very... Um, uh, easy to manipulate uh, fabric and make that shape. So it, you can see in this nar in this uh, novel illustration, even Glinda has a pointy hat. But of course, now we associate those pointy hats with witches, and perhaps rightly so, with Salem and such. But the pilgrims wore pointy hats, and it wasn't just a uh, it wasn't just the wicked of the w witch of the west who would have done that. Interesting side note: I used to work at a historical outdoor drama, and when we were doing research for Native Americans, a lot of them wore turbans. But once again, you can't necessarily put a dark-skinned person in a turban. In a modern context, people are going to think people from the Middle East rather than Indian Native American. So we have to focus on what the audience expectation and balance that with historical accuracy, right? So the audience expects the Wicked Witch of the West to be green and in a pointy hat. They don't expect Glinda to be in a pointy hat. So just because we want to be 100% historically accurate, um, remember that psychology of costume, not just accuracy, but also psychology. So the most famous, famous media form is the movie, 1939, it came out starring the beautiful and talented Judy Garland. Um, it deviated a lot from the original book. As I said, Baum's book was nightmarish. It was grotesque at times. American musicals, especially in the golden age of American musicals, were jazz hands and tap dancing. There were still dark moments. I don't to say, mean to say that Wizard of Oz didn't scare the bejesus out of me the first time I watched it. Um, I always find it interesting when I am in class and I ask people by a show of hands, how many of you have seen The Wizard of Oz? How many people haven't seen The Wizard of Oz? It is uh, one of the top 10 movies of all time based on Rotten Tomatoes. All of these websites uh, all agree Wizard of Oz is at least one of the most influential. Um, I know it's not the newest, it's from 1939, but uh, man, if you've never seen The Wizard of Oz, it's on YouTube. Go watch it. So... It, it is an American musical. It is um, flashy, uh, technicolor. We have huge sets. We have larger-than-life costumes. It was a blockbuster by all accounts. And um, MGM put a lot of money into making it um, a larger-than-life experience in the way of a great American musical. So another version of The Wiz, it's the great American fairy tale. So when people of color sat down to write a version, they wanted to write it in a way that they could celebrate, right? So it's a little bit different and um, than the 1939 version. I love The Wiz, and uh, I know Michael Jackson is there, and I have mixed emotions about Michael Jackson after that documentary. Ooh. Um, but I, I st still... The the Wiz as a script um, is just a beautiful piece of art. So let's look at some of the differences, just as a study in culture. So we talked about how art is a reflection of culture. So let's talk about the differences between rural and metro America. So the original Frank Baum version, The Wizard of Oz, the 1939 musical, both were set in Kansas. The Wiz is in a Harlem snowstorm. Once again, they're performing black performers for black audiences. They're trying to tell the African-American experience, not a lot of black folks in Kansas, right? So they set it instead in Harlem in the middle of a snowstorm instead of a tornado. Not a lot of tornadoes in Harlem, once again. So we represent the Lollipop Guild, uh, these little munchkins, which I think if there was a 2019 version, we probably wouldn't have munchkins, uh, but... In The Wiz, there are these kids hanging out in the street, and they can do backflips, and in the movie version, they're wearing Technicolor, they're wearing bright, black light sensitive clothing, um, and uh, they're sassy and fun, but it's still a new world to her. She still goes from Harlem to Oz and is surprised. Um, 
And the Tin Man uh, in The Wizard of Oz is a woodsman, which is a role that we don't really have anymore. A woodsman was a person who would take an axe and go cut down um, timber, would go, you know, chop down trees in the forest. Um, Woodsman is no longer, you know, a career path. I doubt any of you are studying to be a woodsman. So the Wiz created a, a new concept for that, and they created a piece of circus equipment that she comes across in this circus um, and that's in the movie version comes across this circus equipment that's been abandoned and is all rusted over and has the same basic concept as the woodsman in the wizard of oz there's this trippy scene where they come into a field of poppies now if you don't know poppies have seeds on them which are opium right? Uh, You may be more familiar with opioids, right? Things that get you high. And so they had this moment where they lay down in the field of poppies and they have this sort of dream sequence where they all go to sleep and then Toto wakes them up and they, you know, oh, I can't get lost in drug land. I got to keep going on the road. Well, in The Wiz, instead they go into a red-like district and there are these women in red and they're sort of, um, you know, seducing all of the characters, and it's a much more modern metro version of, you know, the sleazy part of town where you can get drugs and prostitutes. And the monkeys, who those scary monkeys, of course, The Wizard of Oz, the original movie, we were basing that off of a toy that was available, you could, it had those symbols that would clash together, and people were familiar with that, Fez, monkey hat and vest but that's not really something that modern audiences were familiar with so they changed it to a motorcycle gang which in the 70s late 70s was all the rage so why am i taking the time to go through this well i am asking you in your assignment to create a high concept for the wizard of oz it's the american fairy tale so how can you make it yours maybe you set it in modern day Um, pick a character to create a rendering for who you identify with Um, maybe you've always liked the tin man and so what does your tin man look like does he is he into cars is he um, in some way specific to what you enjoy what does a nashville tin man look like for example so um uh I'll ask you to fill out that worksheet and submit the rendering to me. Once again, don't get too caught up in the drawing of it. I do ask that you take some time to really help communicate your ideas, color it, um, you know, really apply yourself. And there's a rubric in there for you to look at and have fun with it. If you're having trouble getting hold of supplies, I have those available in my office. I can um, send those via courier to any campus. Please don't let the supplies be the thing that keep you from doing your best on this assignment. So for more information, please go read uh, the instructions for the assignment in your D12 shell. So moving on to makeup. So there are different kinds of reasons for applying makeup in the stage. And this was once again from the Wiz at Hattiesburg High. And um, I cannot take credit for that beauty makeup. She did it herself. And I just love the way she chose to do her eye makeup. Traditionally, makeup has been something that people use to enhance their appearance. And a lot of doing makeup for the stage is just taking that to another level, exaggeration. Um, She probably wouldn't wear that kind of makeup to class, you know, that level of um, extension out into all the way out to the side of her face, you know, it wouldn't put those bold colors on. But depending on what kind of place you're performing in, you may need more bold colors in order to be seen from the audience. So there's character creation. You can see there my tin man. And I have applied a latex piece to his chin to give it a different dimension. Uh, There's a wrinkle in the middle, and that's bothering me right now as I look at it. Um, Latex pieces are held on with spirit gum, which is a a glue that you tap onto somebody's face, and then you have to kind of tap it to make it sticky, and then apply that latex piece. Spirit gum remover is kind of a harsh chemical, and of course some people are allergic to latex. If you're interested in makeup, um, I really recommend this show called Face Off on the Sci-Fi Channel. It is fascinating to watch the character creation, to watch people build latex pieces, um, to watch people take off latex pieces. Um, 
I have a lot of students who go on to MTSU and take theatrical makeup and have so much fun transforming themselves, aging themselves, making latex pieces, creating characters. Uh, it's a great way to express yourself and have fun. Um, and it's really a grassroots thing these days with uh, YouTube channels. If you're ever wanting to have a cheap Halloween costume, um, you know, using face makeup, if you ever want to pump up your vacation Bible school at your church and, and do some face painting, uh, you know, really makeup is not that expensive if you're willing to buy it cheaply and it can be a lot of bang for your buck. I say that. I definitely know, have some friends with a makeup addiction and they're constantly buying like MAC makeup and expensive makeup. It can be expensive. <laughs> this actress got so mad at me because I really wanted her makeup to depict her as the bad guy. And I'm sorry it's grainy. I didn't take a lot of good pictures during this process. I was very busy. But I put those evil eyebrows. She almost looked like a person in drag. And um, But that was because she was playing the bad guy. She was playing Eveline, um, the Wicked Witch, who is you know, running this factory in the whiz. And so she needed to uh, be ugly, and which was not what she wanted. But once again, I'm there to tell the story. I'm not there to please the actor. She did like that wig, though, and I did pretty good with that wig. So makeup in the Eastern world is very, very specific. And when we look at uh, Kabuki, for example, that red color means that he is loyal and a hero. Once again, it depends what tradition or culture you're in. Red in the Western world often means the devil or the bad guy. So um, don't automatically presume through your own lens the connotations that come along with it. And uh, so in Asian theater, often they're representing gods and folk stories that people already know. And the colors on the masks that you may sing hang in um, an Asian restaurant, those uh, people who are familiar with that folklore can look at that mask and say, oh yeah, that's the monkey king. He's a trickster. Uh, he's um, a demigod. And and so there's a bigger indication of character through makeup. And there's a longer tradition in Asian theater of using that mask. We kind of abandoned the masks after the 16th century uh, for the most part. Uh, there's still some use of masks today, but in Asian theater, the, the legend continues. And um, so we'll get more into that when we get into the traditions of theater. Kim Kardashian did not invent contouring. When you're performing in a large space, you really have to shade your face and so that you don't look like a ghost and so that you have forms on your face that help tell the story. Um, it, uh, if you're in a really big mega theater, it, you, it's really important that there be a sharp contrast around your chin between that line underneath your jawline, uh, contouring your face. If you've maybe watched a concert that someone's performing in um, Madison Square Garden and then they do a close-up of, you know, Lady Gaga. She's a bad example because she always wears really theatrical makeup. But, you know, they look like a clown close up. But from far away from the cheap seats in Madison Square Garden – you can barely define their face. So makeup and costumes and set design need to take into account the kind of space you're performing in. You would not need to contour your face that much if you were performing in a 100-seat theater, in the round especially. Uh, I don't even, in my theater, make my guys wear a lot of makeup because it's not a huge space. And sometimes wearing too much makeup can uh, distract. So that's something for you to critique too as you go through. Did someone have distracting makeup on? Was their makeup different from somebody else in the cast in a way that was obvious? Was there a sense of ensemble about the makeup? Um, I recently went to go see uh, Nevermore at the Fly in Shebville and the makeup was just amazing. And they used... Uh, black lights and uh, it really popped off the stage and was terrifying for some of the characters because these were these Edward Al Edgar Allan Poe characters who were already scary and uh, really helped and aided in the storytelling. So makeup is not to be underestimated as a tool for theater. Moving on to lighting, this is Olivia Ayers and she was running the lights for um, Oh, the Wizard of Oz. So there on the right side, you can see those green lights. So for every body mic pack, she has a radio channeled in and she is 
um, tuning in on every one of those dimmers she has, or the sliders, I guess if it's not a light board, it's considered a slider. You can see that she can adjust the volume of each, each individual mic that's on stage. On the left hand side, she's got her CD player for her canned sound effects for um, music to transition between scenes. In front of her, she has the script, which is her prompt book that has highlighted um, cues for her to move from one moment to the next. So being a soundboard operator, being a lightboard operator is complex. You have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to focus and to stay on your cues, just like a um, just like any performer. Before we get into talking about lights and sounds, it's worth mentioning that great art conceals art. If you go to a play and the lights never distract from the story and the sound, the mics never cut out or um, give feedback, then those technicians have done a great job and there's no need to write about it in your live production critique because the great art of it, they're them doing a fantastic job has concealed how hard it is. If you ever watch the Olympics and then the first time they jump off the diving board, you're like, oh, wow. And then by the third jump, you're like, oh, he didn't point his toes, right? You may, they make it look easy, deceptively easy. And so when I talk today about, you know, the tip of the iceberg, just kind of showing you a tiny bit of what um, lighting and sound technicians go through, please understand that if everything goes right, somebody's doing their job. And that's sort of the magic of theater too. So, theaters have historically been very dangerous place. Uh, there, we used to use the sun was obviously the first lighting instrument, and as I said in in the theater of Delphi, we know that the sun was what. Um, kept the show going, what lit the show, as it was with the no theater, outdoor theater, up until about the 16th century, it was all outdoors. Then during the Jacobean times, they started using lots and lots of candles, uh, which you can imagine was pretty dangerous. Then we got into gas lights, which were even more dangerous in crowded theaters, having gas lights, um, uh, you know, gas going through the walls, super super um, uh, dangerous. Um, and so even today, theaters have to go to extreme measures to guarantee the safety of their patrons. Uh, for example, in our theater, we have um, a firewall that can come down behind the proscenium and make sure that if a fire starts on stage, that it doesn't reach the audience. Um, that's primarily because lighting instruments get so hot and they're, you know, our curtains are fire treated, so they're not going to catch fire, but lots of things can catch fire. Electrical fires happen all the time and it can be very scary. The images I have here are what are called the limelight. You may have somebody say that before, she stepped into the limelight or found their limelight. Um, that of course came from the chemical lime and that device up there, often just a, that device was right on top of the actor in the cats up high and would create this little solo spot, um, which is a precursor to the modern spotlight. People used footlights, they used mirrors, there were many, many tricks of the trade in creating these lights. Um, but we are so thankful today, even in the last 15 years that I've been involved in this industry, we've had huge leaps and bounds. Um, I'm proud to say that Motlow has quite a few LED lights that don't get hot, which is a game changer for me, who has burned myself on lighting instruments so many times. Um, LED lights are often intelligent, so they're easier to program, and uh, they are uh, more responsible energy-wise. They don't use up as much energy. Uh, when your OF Hall is as old as I am, it was in 1983 it was built, so some of the electrics are still sort of tricky and um, finicky, as in any old house, and uh, these LED lights are a dream come true, and as much as I can replace those LED lights with my budget, I'll continue to do that in our efforts to be a more green, a more sustainable campus, and because they're cool, they uh, change colors, they're intelligent often, you can push a button, and they'll swerve to the other side of the stage, oh, they're just fantastic. So the number one job of any lighting is to create visibility. Here's another picture from Wicked. Um, if I couldn't see Glinda's face when she's coming in in that big beautiful uh, bubble machine, then I'm not doing my job. 
the number one job of a lighting designer. And you can get into it and have fun and create all these fantastic effects. But if I can't see the story, I'm going to lose interest. So it's always important to make sure that the um, main focus of the story is is lit, that you're directing the audience's eye and we can clearly see um, what we're supposed to be seeing, right? Creating focus. Lighting can create a mood. Mong chicka wow wow. On that left hand side we have a picture of glass menagerie and um, we see that the male suitor has come and he's looking at all her little glass pieces but that candlelit moment creates a sense of ambiance that helps tell the story and creates a mood. You can also tell that it's nighttime by the fact that the light, the only um, light directionality is from that lamp, from that candle. Uh, you know, this moonlit Laura on the right hand side, we can tell that it's nighttime and that the moon is spilling through. We can tell from the cool light that it's moonlight and that helps give us a time of day. And it has sort of a winter effect. It has sort of a season, um, which we know that this scene from uh, Glass Menagerie is in the winter time. It also gives us a sense of place. Light coming through that window looks pretty modern to us. And we can see that, um, you know, if we have the sun, then it could be a timeless show. But if we have a street lamp, that can have a very 1940s detective feel. So um, the season, you know, the color changes throughout the time of day. Uh, you know, sunset colors are warm and vibrant. Morning light is often um, a little more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Crisp, maybe. Um, and it's amazing to see a good lighting designer show us kind of place through the um, through the colors and the hues that they choose. I love on page 238, there's this fantastic picture from Underpants, which is a Steve Martin play. And there's a white set, and then we have what a lighting designer can do to paint that set with color. And it's just um, phenomenal. It's amazing how much can be changed just through the lighting, through directionality, through uh, focus and movement and creating a sense of place. It's also worth mentioning that a cheap way sometimes to create a sense of place is through gobos and creating shadows. So I can get a little um, metal tile and put it in front of a lighting instrument and it'll cast a shadow of, for example, a tree, which will indicate a sense of place even though um, I don't have a whole tree built there. The lighting can indicate a piece of scenery. And so gobos can be very useful tools that way. So a lighting plot, you can see I have different, I have an instrument key there at the bottom, which shows me which ones are scoops, which ones are strip lights, which ones are um, Fresnels or uh, ERSs. And so I sit and map out my battens and say, okay, I can have this many um, electrics, I can have this many plugins, and I have these instruments pointed uh, stage left and those instrument pointed stage right and we have multiple instruments on every spot on stage so that we don't have really harsh shadows uh, a light plot does several things it helps me determine what colors i can use based on what's available um, you know it's fun to have light specials where there's a special effect through a strobe or something else but if the first responsibility is to visibility so if I don't have enough instrumentation to even fill the plot to even have just a general wash that I feel comfortable with then I can't get into my light specials I can't get into my strobing effects or my special colors because first I need to just have a general wash where people can see right um, so light plot tells us what colors we can use, where those instruments are pointed, the location of them, the kind of instrument that's plotted out here. Um, but of course, this is static. It's not a living 
thing. This plot doesn't tell us the timing. It doesn't tell us um, which ones are turned on at what times. So it's just a rudimentary thing. And that's often, once you kind of establish a light plot, you may vary it a little bit from show to show, but often it remains the same. And this is something kind of tucked away in a filing cabinet <laughs> that you can pull out for your master electricians so that they can understand. Uh, the other thing that this does is checks your wattage. So just if you've ever lived in an old house and plugged in your curling iron and your hair dryer at the same time and you bust a circuit, this helps us understand that um, we're not going to burn down the building, right? Making sure that our wattage is okay and we're not overstretching the capacity for our space. So every instrument, you can see those lighting instruments, that's Zan, my silly stage manager, um, and those instruments above his head at Hattiesburg High, uh, each one has a color on it. Very rarely am I going to just put white light on an actor or they'll all look like ghosts. And this is the whiz. So we have bright pink, bright orange, bright yellow. It feels more like a rock concert. Gel is just plastic sheet that you put over in front of a lighting instrument to create a sense of color. To create like natural sky, can you guess what colors we use? Uh -huh. uh, amber and cyan. So like a light yellow and a light blue. Kind of like the sun and the clouds the reflection of the sky. We put those two colors together, they create a nice, natural, warm light. Uh, now, it matters if you you have actors of color, they, they're much more resilient against white light. Um, but pasties like me and Zan, we need blues and yellows to help us look not like ghosts, right? So different colors are more flattering to different people. And uh, that may not be the desired effect. A lot of spotlights, you can change the gel color instantly through the tap of a button or moving a slider. Um, LED lights automatically change gel colors and uh, in a way that's more sustainable. Obviously, those gels, because instruments get really hot, those gels burn out. So we're constantly having to replace the gels, climb up on ladders, change those little sliders out, get new plastic ones out. Um, depending on the intensity of the light, they can burn up more quickly. So um, gel is something always throwing around a theater. Uh, if you're you know, like a classroom teacher and you have an LED light, it's fun to sometimes put a gel uh, under it just to create some fun lighting in your classroom. Lighting can put people at ease. If you're in a hospital, for example, and you have a harsh overhead, buzzy, ugh, green kind of lighting, it can feel institutional and personal. Try turning on a lamp and turning off that overhead light and it can calm and soothe and feel more homey. Um, bring in a lamp from home that um, creates um, a sense of comfort for you. Uh, lighting can often be key to, to mood and ambiance for any space. So. Um, obviously, theatrical lamps aren't the only way that we create light on stage. We've already shown a window. We've already shown a, a candle on stage. Um, but gelling creates the colors and the feel and the emotion and the psychology of light that is important to set the scene. So let's just quickly go over some lighting instruments. I don't test you over this, just FYI. So that's an ERS. Those are the most expensive of the ones we have in our space, and they throw over a long distance. So um, you saw that picture of me sitting up in the light booth. All of those on that first batten are ERSs, and they are strong, and they, look, they can go far as opposed to this little puny Fresnel uh, focusing lens. And, and this one is just on a tree. And so if you go to like an outdoor concert and you look up and there's this silver thing with multiple lamps hanging off of it, uh, you're probably looking at like a cheap Parkan and maybe Fresnel focus lights. Uh, fo Fresnels usually are hanging right above the actor's heads. Uh, Fresnel is just the way that that lens is focused. Um, but you can see the different things that are on the outside of the light. Uh, safety cables are huge for us at Motlow. We, we always have clamps and, and C clamps and safety cables on every instrument just to make sure our people are safe. But just once again, um, please don't go get into any lighting situation and just kind of start racking around. Uh, you can hurt yourself, you can hurt others, you can burn yourself. If you touch a lot of those instruments, the, the uh, light bulb part, they once they're exposed to the oils on your skin, um, then they're ruined, the bulbs are. So please, please, please be careful around lighting instruments that can be very expensive and uh, they're very fragile. 
if you're dealing with old equipment especially. Now none of these are LED lights. <laughs> none of these. Oh wait, that, that Fresnel says LED bulb behind it, doesn't it? Uh, that make a liar out of me. So this is a moment in Midsummer Night's Dream where we drop the baton and created kind of a UFO effect with what are called intelligent lights or moving lights. Um, those you can, anytime you see kind of like a searchlight at a concert or uh, lights that are rotating, um, on a baton, those are often intelligent lights and you can program those through your computer uh, to move and synchronize and change colors or to react to the music organically. These movers are just so much fun to play with and uh, there's a lot that they can do that I don't even understand yet, um, but they hang on battens above. You can see all the wires hanging around there, um, you know, plugging into the different uh, electric uh, things on the bat in there so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more I know it's hard to look at a light plot and understand what it is uh, I wish that we were in the theater and I could bring it down and you could you know smell it and see it I feel like that's a lot more productive conversation I hope you're getting this but um so your, your ERS is on page 239 talks about uh, the, all the ways that they're intelligent and, and how valuable they are and their, and their wattage and their and floodlight especially. So moving into cues. Cues are any prearranged signal. So this is the person up in the booth pressing the go button on the lights like I was. Um, they're waiting for a special moment. This is part of the reason it's responsible for actors to learn their lines well and not just wing it because the people who are carrying out the furniture, moving on props, um, you know, pressing the go button for that light change, they're waiting for a certain word, a certain moment in the script. And uh, if you miss that cue, then you could throw off their stacks. You could throw off the next cue that they're waiting for. Right, and so um, all of the people working these boards have to be good listeners and also good improvisers. They have to be people who can work well under pressure. If it's well programmed, though, it can be a pretty easy job. I just sit there and press the go button, you know, every time I hear a good cue as I follow along in the script. So if somebody asks you to run a board, just know it's not always the hardest thing. Um, if it's well programmed by your master electrician or by your sound designer. So what are the things that they're listening for? Sometimes it's a certain word. Sometimes it's an, a gesture that they make with, a, you know, a prop. Um, sometimes the stage manager or the light board operator are taking their cue off the soundboard, for example. So if you're sitting there in an audience and you see that the lights are supposed to go out, the actor's looking around, obviously, like, who's forgetting to turn out the lights? Uh, it could be the actor's fault. So before you go in blaming the tech crew, just know that there's plenty of blame to go around, especially when it comes to queuing. Sometimes there really is somebody asleep in the booth. Uh, but once again, good art conceals art. Nobody thinks about the microphones until we get feedback. Then everybody turns around and looks at the sound booth, right? Um, but queuing is dependent on the actor's ability to follow the scripts. And uh, it's definitely part of the trust and the faith of theater that makes it an ensemble, is that we all depend on each other, right? And uh, definitely this is one of those areas that there's a lesson to be learned in all of your vocations, that we're taking cues off of each other, that when someone is being generous with you in that moment, uh, for you to jump in and follow up and uh, be there for them and make sure you're paying attention and listening in that moment uh, through gestures and physical. I've learned a lot about human behavior by being a board op. I know that sounds kind of weird, uh, but I learned the subtleties of body language and jumping in at any moment to um, help the show go on, right? And so uh, listening to those subtleties and being there in the moment and disciplining yourself. I will just say in an age of distraction, an age where I feel like my phone is reprogramming my brain, it's hard sometimes to discipline myself to be here now in Zen and in the moment and paying attention to the show rather than playing on my phone or um, thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner or making my shopping list. Um, queuing can be kind of a cool sort of Zen experience where you really have to be in the moment. 
so sound. This is from The Wiz. We have a full pit there. You can see two piano players, a drummer, a bassist, a guitarist. It's a rock and roll show, The Wiz is. And uh, this is a great example too. You can see the light that's projected on the floor is meant to look like the yellow brick road, but that's just a lighting effect. And it's a soft focus lighting effect so that you can see the orchestra, but it's not a harsh spot on the orchestra so that you want to pay attention to them. Um, I always try with my musicals to have live pits. I say that Madagascar's not, but um, I think a live pit orchestra really brings a lot to the table. So um, because you kind of get a whole music concert at the same time that you get a theatrical experience. So I, I would encourage you if you can, when you pick your live theater production, look for something with a real orchestra in it. Um, it really is a fantastic part of the experience. Uh, from that first moment the overture starts and you get to sort of watch the dis different um, instrumentalists in action. Uh, you know, you, like I said, you get a rock concert at the same time that you get a theatrical experience. I will be humble here and say I don't have an ear for sound or I, I can hear what's on pitch and off pitch, but the level of mixing some people just have this understanding of music and pitch and timber and um can hear the subtleties in music my mother is a music teacher and it's always humbling to me because you know while i think i can sing on pitch and tell when somebody else is off pitch there's a lot that i miss by not being a musical expert so i always am humble and hire a music director uh, sometimes my mother to help me with the sound of things and making sure that the mix is good um, i was a drummer for years and years in a bad garage band and uh, i would always play too loud <laughs> which is like the number one sin of the of the garage band uh you know drummer is playing too loud but i, I couldn't hear it i couldn't hear the difference so it takes a certain amount of uh, skill to run sound. So, so while sound, like I said, the ancient Grecians used to have megaphones in their masks. They built into the side of the um, landscape in a way that was more resonant and helped uh, with the acoustics of the space. We recently, in our redesign of, of Motlow Theater, uh, in Powers Auditorium, we used to have carpet on the wall, and a we actually had a person who specialized in acoustics come and rip out the carpet and put in sound panels. Somebody with that finely tuned of an ear, um, because it was like yelling into a pillow, Tom Waits style, yelling uh, in the the space was too absorbent with those um, with the carpet on the wall. It was also nasty. You could smell the mustiness on the carpet. So I'm so glad that carpet isn't on the wall anymore. Of course, in the good old days, though, it was just people speaking loud enough to be heard. Maybe they had a megaphone. Um, maybe there was good acoustics in the space. But it was on the onus was on the actor, which is what we talked about in acting, that the voice could be projected. Um, but in modern sound design, there's a lot more in going on here. So we've got a lot of spaces, a lot of actors, especially with the rigorous schedules we have now where people are doing 72 performances, um, you know, two on Sunday, two on Saturday, every day of the week except for Monday, they're in that theater uh, despite changes in the weather for their sinuses. Uh, so miking those actors helps them be more sustainable and having those body mics on those actors helps them um, along the way. Now, not every theater is going to be able to do that. Not every actor gets to be miked, um, but it is uh, a way to help. Also, when you have that soundboard operator who's able to blend the actor's voices, you know, maybe the person who talks too loud, <coughs> me, uh, gets turned down a little bit, and the person who doesn't speak loud enough, we can turn theirs up. So especially with amateur actors, it's great to have mics. Um, you know, everybody's mics don't always turn on, and that's part of the actor has the onus there to project more when they hear that their mic isn't on. Sometimes the battery pack is out, sometimes the wires come loose, sometimes um, the radio signal has been lost. So there's a lot going on when you are maybe at a performance and you can't hear somebody who you could previously hear, just know their mic pack's probably gone out. And uh, lots of things can be going on in that moment. Sound often um, 
amping our music. So that pit I showed last time, we've got amps there um, that the guitars are picked up into. And uh, we have monitors where the actors can hear the music. And then we have amps that send them speakers that send the music out into the audience getting the mix right there so the drummer isn't too loud I know I'm guilty so sound design creates sound effects right so if we hear a knock on a door for example um, we can either can that sound effect we have a recorded sound effect or we can do it live and maybe have a mic by that sound effect to help create that so as I just said, some sounds can be live, others can be recorded. The mix between recorded sounds and live sound effects is also a place for criticism. Uh, can sound effects sometimes sound fake? Um, recorded previously can sometimes sound grainy or poor recorded quality. Um, singing along to a music track can be tricky for some actors. So um, there's a lot to be considered about the difference between live and recorded music and a lot of room for criticism there. If you're doing a show, like I said, I recently saw Nevermore, which is the Edward, Edgar Allan Poe musical, um, there was a lot of voice effects, especially for the character creations, where there are these nightmarish imaginings of Edgar Allan Poe. And then we have this echoey voice, for example, that adds to the creepy factor. When I did Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, when Alice fell down the rabbit hole, um, we had that echo effect to make it sound like she's going through the rabbit hole. So... Sometimes we can use sound to help set a mood. So instead of calling them sound effects, your textbooks calls them motivated sounds. So um, this has been a huge part of theater for a long time. Even going back to ancient Greek, they had these um, thunder sheets, which were large pizza pieces of metal. And every time a god or goddess appeared, they would shake that metal and it sounded like thunder it reverberated through the space. Um, obviously, if you were watching a radio show, recently watched Annie, and you got to hear the lovely gaffer uh, making those, you know, sound effects with their wood blocks, for example. Uh, this is cool, too, to watch movies, and um, sometimes if you're watching kind of the uh, behind the scenes extras on on the film, you can see how the how the gaffer, you know, put in these musical sound effects, and it's kind of cool. Um, now, he's particularly calling our gentlemen who wrote our textbooks are calling these motivated sounds things that are called for by the script right so a car motor turning off a slamming door sounds that are required by the story right as opposed to environmental sounds I'll have to go back to that environmental sounds on the other hand are just sounds that help um, create a sense of everyday life so I have a tornado sequence here where dancers were representing the tornado. The sound of wind whistling, not necessary to tell the story, um, but helps create a sense of environment. You may want to pause this, uh, this lecture and take a moment to just hear the sounds around you. That sonority of time and place helps ground you in your reality right very rarely is it solidly quiet if you're on the interstate there's the sounds of wishing cars going by if you're at home maybe the dishwasher's on if you're at starbucks maybe it's the espresso maker and that sonority helps ground you in time and space and give you a sense of reality so if i'm trying to do a realistic play um, then i'm going to create the sound effects that come from that space to help indicate especially at the beginning of the scene so if we're doing for example a movie and i need uh, to help set up the location i cannot tell you how many movies or sitcoms have the sound of construction automatically we know we're in new york city right because that's just the sound of new york city honking taxis and construction going on constantly that jackhammer so environmental sound um, gives you a sense of reality so body mics. I chose this picture because you can see our princess there has that body mic on her cheek, right? Um, and that body mic um, is a new one. I'm very proud. It's wireless. So the performer, I, by wireless, I just mean that it's not wired like a regular mic, a handheld mic like this mic into an amp or anything that it exists on a radio frequency. And that body pipe, Mac, uh, potty mic pack the 
Mike Pack is concealed inside of her costume. If you see uh, something square shaped, maybe lit up through a costume, that could just be the body Mike Pack. If you're ever working with a microless, uh, a wireless microphone, make sure that you adjust that little um, face piece so that it is close enough to your face to be heard, but not so close that it pops. A lot of amateur theater that I see, they're wearing their mic wrong. The mic is worth thousands of dollars, but they just don't know how to wear it. It's kind of heartbreaking. Um, but mics are tricky. Mics are not easy, and they require a lot of maintenance. They require um, quite a bit of uh, not only maintaining the instrument itself, but a, a certain level of competency as, as the sound designer in um, in adjusting there's a lot of settings on mics and I'm showing my ignorance here because I know so little about it I rely on the fantastic sound designers that I have worked with um, when it comes to amplification but I cannot remember the last time I went to go see a show that was amateur that didn't have a problem with the body mics they're just notoriously persnickety honestly so so sound reinforcement is what we were talking about before, just making sure that the actor can sustain their voice through using amplified sound. Um, that can be a performer or a musical instrument, but sound reinforcement, I'm trying to find the exact page number for that, but it seems to have evaded me. Oh yeah, we're still on page 245 for sound reinforcement. Um, and just making sure that there's enough amplification so that the actors don't wear out their instrument so that the blend of actors on stage can be strong enough a common critique which is a fair critique is maybe you couldn't understand what the actor was saying because the band was too loud um, or uh, you know sometimes if you get seated too close to the orchestra I love my South Jackson but they seat people right behind the orchestra and sometimes that can overpower um, the singers on stage because you're so close to the the uh, drums for example and they're just so loud or the tuba you know whatever the case may be um, having a good blend where you can still understand what's going on on stage and different shows require different blends if it's a rock opera style then the band band is louder but if it's a more typical um, orchestral sort of sound then we need to focus on the story and the band needs to tone it down so depending on the kind of music you're dealing with it should have a different sound right all right, well, that has got to the end of my humbling uh, oversimplification of uh, lighting and sound, at least. I hope that you have learned enough to be able to critique and to understand how much goes into these things, how much um, we don't know, uh, which is always humbling, I think. Um, it's worth mentioning again the nature of sound to set up a mood or an atmosphere, the nature of lighting to set up a mood and atmosphere. If you want to, for example, have an office that people feel invited into, maybe turn off that harsh buzzing overhead light. Um, you know, remember the power of music to change your mood. If you're having a bad day, put on your favorite song. Sing aloud entirely to uh, sing along entirely too loud. Um, music and sound uh, lights have the power to alter our mood. Uh, remember the psychology of costume. What are you wearing? What does that say about you? If you wear flip-flops to that job interview, does that mean you're going to be hired? Sometimes we wear costumes in order to fit in. Uh, what's the psychology of what you're wearing? What does it say about you? Um, I have a lot of millennial students who come in and they're not interested in what clothes say about us. They say, oh, that's capitalistic. That's, um, you know, that's my grandparents' way of seeing clothes. And maybe that's true, but if you're going into a job interview, you need to think about playing the game, right? And uh, putting yourself out there in a way that is um, going to send the best message to people around you, right? So... Um, get started on that rendering and uh, hope you have fun and enjoy creating a costume for a character in The Wizard of Oz. As always, thank you for listening.